you're joining us online, we just welcome you. Um, we're going to, we also want to welcome and bless the moms here. We are celebrating Mother's Day. And um, so we're celebrating all you moms out there or expecting mothers. Um, I know that it can be, a, it's a great holiday. It can also be a hard um, holiday because there there's people who are trying to be mothers and they, they long to be mothers or they lost a mother or... Um, so we just want to encourage you and bless you and just know that, that you are loved and um, we're grateful for all you, all you moms out there. Um, we're going to spend some time and worship together. So as we praise, um, my prayer is that, that you'll feel his love um, because his love conquers all. And knowing that we can look to him for strength, for guidance, um, that when we're faced with different circumstances in our lives, um, we won't be overwhelmed, that we won't be afraid. Um, I know I've been very overwhelmed um, recently. Uh, my weeks have just been really hard. And if I didn't have God by my side, I really don't know how I'd get through. So I don't know what circumstances you're all facing, but just know and be encouraged that he is with you. And just look to him and speak to him. Speak to Jesus in those moments. And he's going to meet you right where you are. He's going to meet you um, just here now, um, today. And we are going to be just in his presence and we're gonna just soak in his love and we're gonna um, just pray that chains be broken off of you um, today. Chains be broken off, what, whatever that looks like, anxiety, depression, fear, whatever that is, just release it all to him and let them break, let them fall. And whatever's been holding you down from what God has for you, he's gonna bring victory. So we're gonna, we're gonna praise together. So please stand and join us.
There is peace.
Oh, Lord, thank you so much. Father, we can't do this without you. We can't do this life without you. And we're here praising you. We're in your presence. And your presence is heavy upon us. You are here. So I pray that we just receive your grace, receive your love, receive that confidence in who you say we are. We are your children, who you love deeply. Doesn't matter what we've done, doesn't matter where we go, doesn't matter about our past, our present, our future. It's all in your hands. And we can have confidence in knowing that, knowing who you are, you're a father. You love each and every single one of us, Lord. So whatever we're battling, whatever we're struggling, whatever is holding us down, I pray that those chains break right now. Let them fall away so that we can walk freely in your love, in your light, in your grace. I pray that you empty out anything within us that is not of you, anything toxic, anything um, holding us down. Just empty us out so we can be filled with your glory. And we can have confidence moving forward, knowing that you hold our future in our hands. We aren't perfect. We make mistakes, we fall, but you love us anyway. And we receive that today. I pray a blessing over each person here. I pray a blessing over the moms all that they do for their families. They're so appreciated and I pray that they, that they know that, that they're so appreciated and loved by their families, by their loved ones, by you. I pray for those who are struggling, who may have lost a mom or are trying to have a baby and trying to start a family and it's a struggle. I just pray a blessing over them, Lord, that they know they're loved and cared for. Just be with them, Lord. Give them the strength to move on. So we thank you so much for who you are, for all you do, for all you're gonna do. I pray a blessing over the message that we're about to hear. Just meet us where we are, Father. Meet us here, touch our hearts, speak to us right now. We pray all of this in your beautiful name, amen. You may all be seated. Welcome to Thrive Church. My name is Judah Thomas. I'm a lead pastor here at Thrive, and we welcome you here, and we wish all the mothers a very happy Mother's Day. Let's give it up again for the moms, and we are so grateful. Without you, we can say this honestly, without you, we wouldn't be here, moms. So, so happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Since it's Mother's Day, um, I figured what better way to celebrate mothers than from hearing from an actual mother. So if you would please help me in welcoming my wife, the mother to our four kids, and the best mom I've ever known, Carrie Thomas. Welcome her up here. Thank you very much. And I also want to wish all of you a very happy Mother's Day. And I just want to applaud you all for being here because I know what a challenge it can be to get to church. And it's especially difficult when you have kids. As Pastor Judah said, we have four kids. So the way that we usually get to church on Sunday is he usually brings the older kids with him because they come very early. And then we have a toddler and he's a little bit difficult to get ready and get out of the house. So, so I usually get him ready and I bring him and we come later. And not that long ago, I got my, my little boy ready for church. We were running pretty late and we got here. And as I get to church, I get a text message and it's from our family iPad that the kids use to keep in touch. And the text says, where are you? 
And I answer immediately, I'm at church. And then I follow that up with a question, who is this? And I get a response back and I realize it's my daughter who's still at home in her bed, who I had left behind. And she had told me she was coming to church with me and I forgot. And that's why I didn't get mother of the year last year. (laughs) So if you're here with everybody who was supposed to come with you today, then I say you're doing a great job. (laughs) All right. So we're in a series that's called Tricking Jesus. And we've all been tricked before. I've been tricked before. There was a time I was in a fast food restaurant with my husband and we had ordered our meal. And the woman behind the register, she looked at me and she said, apple or cherry turnover with that? And I said, oh, apple. And I got our our food and we sat down And I looked at my receipt and I realized that she had charged me for it. She made it sound like that turnover came with my meal. I felt tricked. I felt manipulated. But I bet she sold a lot of turnovers and she probably got a promotion, you know? Now, there was another time I was tricked. It was just a couple days before Christmas and I was like a bajillion months pregnant. And this woman comes to my door and she says, I just want to give you a free carpet cleaning. I'm like, all right, I have a white carpet in my living room. I'm about to have a baby. It's almost Christmas. Like, that would be awesome. Like, get this rug cleaned up. So she goes back to her car and she rolls into my house with a vacuum cleaner and she starts vacuuming my rug. And you know, It wasn't what I had in mind. I thought maybe I was getting like a shampoo or something, you know, like a professional cleaning. And not only that, but she tried to sell me that vacuum cleaner for $2,500. And I had to listen to her talk for like two hours. I felt tricked and I felt totally manipulated, but I didn't buy the vacuum cleaner. I think I was a little wiser after the turnover incident. But in your Bible, we meet a woman named Martha. Now, Martha is a woman of faith, but she tries to trick Jesus. She tries to manipulate him. Now, before we get into our story about Martha, we're gonna learn a little bit about her. We're gonna get the scoop on who she is. So Martha has a sister named Mary, and she has a brother named Lazarus. You may have heard of Lazarus. He's the one that Jesus raises from the dead. So in this particular story of Lazarus being raised, there's a whole lot that we can learn about Martha and her family. The story mentions Mary, Martha's sister, And it says that she owns a very expensive jar of perfume, which she uses to anoint Jesus's feet before he is crucified. We also learn that Lazarus, after he dies, he's buried in a family tomb. So now both of these little pieces of information indicate that Martha came from a very wealthy family. They were very, very well off to have both of these things. We also learn from the story that when Lazarus dies, many people in the community come to see Martha and Mary and to pay their respects. So that means that they were well respected in the community and they were well known in the community. Okay, so what do we know about Martha's relationship with Jesus? Well, this story also tells us that Martha was loved by Jesus. It says that in John 11, verse five. It specifically says Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And I want you to know how special this shout out is that Martha receives. There's only four people in the Bible who are named as being loved by Jesus. And Martha was one of them. So it's Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and the disciple, John. So we know that Martha was very close to Jesus. She was a friend of Jesus. And we also know she was a woman of faith. When her brother dies, Jesus comes after four days after her brother has died. 
And when she sees him, she says, Jesus, if you had been here, I know that my brother would not have died. She believes that Jesus would have healed her brother. And she also says, right to Jesus, she says, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and that you've come from God. So she was a very godly woman, and she was filled with faith. So now that we know a little bit about her, we're going to get into our story. And it begins in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Now, I want to stop there just for a moment, because it would have been a really big responsibility to have Jesus over to your house. Not only would you be entertaining Jesus, but he would have been bringing his 12 disciples with him at least his 12 disciples, there may have been a few more people there as well. So it would have been a lot of work. It would have been a big financial responsibility to do that. Now, Martha is a gifted housekeeper, and there's two accounts in the Bible where we see that she is hosting Jesus, and she is found serving him. Now, Martha was also very fearless in having Jesus into her home. So not only was it a big group of people to have over, but it was also becoming dangerous to be a friend of Jesus. There were people who wanted Jesus to be dead. And Martha lived in Bethany, which is very close to Jerusalem. And that's the city where we learn that Jesus was later arrested. All right, verse 39. It says, And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, and listened to his teaching. So Mary, Martha's sister, is sitting in the home and she's listening. She is giving Jesus her full attention. And it it says that she was at his feet. And this position at the feet of Jesus is very, very significant because it implies that she was fully submitted to him as her teacher, as her leader. And we see this position of of being at someone's feet in Acts 22.3, where it says that Paul was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was his teacher who was teaching him the Jewish law. So this would have been a position that a man, somebody who was studying to become a rabbi or a student, they would sit at the feet of their teacher and they would listen, and they would show uh, how interested they were in what their teacher was teaching. But now this is a very controversial position for a woman to be in, because a woman would not have been allowed to train under a rabbi or to be a student. So we see her sort of posturing herself as a student of Jesus. And Jesus is so different from other rabbis in that he allows her to do this. And we see this over and over with Jesus, how he allowed women to be such an integral part of his ministry. Okay, Luke 10, 40. And this is where the story gets real. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Oh boy. So Martha was hosting this party she probably had a lot going on and I feel her pain because it is hard, right, to get all of the food ready at the same time. And when you're entertaining somebody really special, you, you really do want everything to be perfect. So she's probably in her mind thinking, you know, how should I cook the meat? Should I saute it? Should I roast it? Should I air fry it? You know, all of these things, right, are going through her mind. And, and not only that, but I mean, there's 15 people there. Now, I read this, right? And I'm thinking like, I only have 12 plates in my house. So she probably had to borrow them from her neighbor who had a different china pattern. And she's probably looking at her table and it's not to her liking. I mean, that alone could have been distracting her. Have you guys ever been distracted like this before? I always get distracted with entertaining But maybe you have too, and maybe just like this, like having a big party or an event, maybe a project that just seems to consume all of your time, your energy, your resources, all of your mental energy. 
And maybe you're the type of person that just gets distracted with the day-to-day stuff and how you're going to cram everything in that you, you can't really think about anything else or even take a breath. A lot of people are like that. Or, or have you ever had like a birthday party for your kid and you wanted to really enjoy it with your kid, but you had so much going on that at the end of it, you felt like it was just over so fast. You didn't even get to see your kid the whole time. That's pretty much how this party is going. So Martha was very distracted with the details of the party and she becomes absorbed in it. So she's serving Jesus, but she's not really listening to Jesus. It says that she was distracted with much serving. And and that word much really sort of indicates that she was doing more than she needed to be doing. She was doing more serving than she really needed to. In your notes, it is possible to be distracted by good things. So Martha is sort of surveying the party, and she feels that there's something unfair about this situation. And here's the part where she tries to trick Jesus into giving her what she wants. Luke 10, 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Now, every time I have read this story, I have pretty much agreed with Martha, you know? It's like the mom in me just comes out and I think, yeah, you know, it does seem pretty unfair for one person to be doing all of the work because we all know the food doesn't cook itself and the dishes don't magically get washed and put back in the cupboards, right? But listen to how she tries to trick Jesus by manipulating him. She accuses him of not caring. Lord, do you not care? And then she, she sort of commands him to make Mary help her. She, she tried to make him feel sorry for all of the stress that she was putting herself through, right? And then she plays a bit of a comparison game. She sort of highlights the fact that she is serving by trying to make her sister look lazy and unhelpful. She says, my sister has left me alone. Oh, poor Martha. But isn't this how we try to trick Jesus sometimes? Because we could pray prayers to manipulate God or to try to manipulate God. You know, we pray things like, you know, Lord, do you not care that that I can't, you know, afford as nice a house as so-and-so? I mean, I'm a nicer person than them. Or, or, Lord, do you not care that I don't have the job of my dreams? You know, that person gets everything. They They get the job that they want. Why can't I have what I want? You know, it's also possible that Martha was a little bit envious of her sister's devotion to Jesus. And her gut reaction It is to try to make Jesus notice what she is doing well. And she expects that Jesus is going to sort of side with her and agree to the demand that she's making and asking Mary to help. But the trick's on her. Luke 10, 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things things. And I think this is the tricky part for me because Martha was serving. She was doing a good thing, just like we all try to do, right? Try to do our best, try to serve. And she was doing a great thing and she was hosting Jesus, but he doesn't agree entirely with her. He doesn't take the bait and he doesn't cave in to her request. You know, he's sort of like a master in solving sibling disputes. Because if you listen to what he said, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, you want to tattle on your sister? Let's talk about you. And he brings it right back around to talk to Martha about her behavior. So we have to pay attention because there's a lot of good parenting stuff in here too. 
But Jesus speaks very kindly to Martha. He says, Martha, Martha. And he shows his love and his compassion for her. And then he clears up all of the unfairness for her. And I want you to listen carefully to this next verse because Jesus is about to simplify your life in five little words. Verse 42, he says, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken from her. He says, but one thing is necessary. Mary had chosen it. She was doing the one necessary thing. What was she doing? She was at the feet of Jesus. She was listening to her teacher. She was making time for him. She was giving her teacher her full attention. Martha was doing a lot of unnecessary stuff. For your notes, Martha's busyness was unnecessary activity she put on herself. Poor Martha. This must have been a very embarrassing situation for her. She didn't expect things to go this way. She was trying to do good. She was serving. We know from what we learned earlier that she was a woman of faith and she loved Jesus. And now she finds herself being corrected. Somebody here today might feel like they're feeling a little correction from the Lord too. And I know that I did as I studied this story, but it's okay. Hebrews 12, five and six says, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. That means we should pay attention to his discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. So we should never feel like a failure or like God doesn't love us when we feel that conviction or when we feel that he is correcting us. Because in the same way that Jesus loved Martha, he loves you too. And it should encourage, encourage us that he loves us enough to correct us. In your notes, Jesus corrects us because he loves us. So here's the thing. Jesus didn't say that Martha wasn't doing a good thing. She was just doing what was unnecessary. She was distracted with much serving to the point that she had become anxious and she had become troubled over her responsibilities, over the dinner that she was preparing. And Jesus didn't like that she had become anxious and she had become troubled. She had put unnecessary burdens and stress on herself. You know, she went way overboard. She was probably fixing like a five course dinner when one course would have been enough. I mean, these are the times when you just order a pizza, right? You know, I had a dinner party go wrong at Christmas time this past year. I attempted to do a prime rib, which I had never made before. And I do that a lot when I'm having company. I, I don't make like my specialty because I feel like if I make my specialty and it doesn't turn out right, then everybody's like, oh, this is her specialty, you know? So I usually pick a new recipe. And that way I feel like I have a little bit of a safeguard because I could say, well, I never made it before. I didn't know how it was gonna turn out. So that's what I did this past Christmas. I decided I was gonna attempt a prime rib. Now, everything was going great until the thing wouldn't cook. And that thing ended up taking like two hours longer than the recipe said. Now, this is Christmas Day. I mean, who has like an extra two hours to wait for dinner, right? Now, I spent a lot of that evening going back and forth to the kitchen and, and testing the internal temperature and praying for 135, you know? But while we waited for the meal, 
we had a lot of appetizers that my daughters had made. They made like this beautiful spread. It was like, you know, meat and cheese and olives and breadsticks. And it was really good. And we all were eating that. And then finally, the prime rib was ready. And the other food was ready. And we sat down to eat it. And it was really good. But you know, we all said it was really good, but it wasn't necessary. You know, we didn't need it. We had all of those great, you know, appetizers and we enjoyed that and we were able to talk and we were like, the dinner was good, but it was like, it was just unnecessary. We didn't have to go through all of that stress. We would have been fine with just the appetizers. And you see, in this situation with Martha, the meal was of little importance to Jesus. He didn't care what he ate. He didn't care if he had five courses and appetizers and soup and salad and nuts and fruit, you know? I mean, he didn't need the whole thing. What was important to him was what he was teaching. Martha was worried about all the details of the entertaining to the point that it distracted her from listening to Jesus. Jesus was more concerned about the spiritual food than about the dinner food. Martha was a little bit focused on what was important to her, what she thought was important to her, and not so much on the things that were important to Jesus. She sort of became weighed down with worldly cares. And it was over these worldly cares, over this dinner, that she became critical of her sister, Mary. For your notes, I should consider what is important to God over what is important to me. And I think moms can relate so easily to Martha. I know that I do. You know, we feel like we try so hard at life. We try to hold everything together to keep the family running, to make sure that everybody has everything that they need, need, that everybody is taken care of. And we just want to be so perfect. Is anybody here willing to confess? They just want to be perfect. I'm going to raise my hand. Yeah, just want to, I want to do it all. And I want to do it so well. And I think that moms feel a lot of pressure, right? We want to excel in our careers. We want to raise good, godly kids who also get straight A's, right? We want to volunteer in school, and we want to volunteer in church, and we want to cook healthy meals, and we want to wear up-to-date styles, and we want to be a great friend, and we want to be a great daughter. Plus, we want to look pretty while we're doing it so we can document all of it on Instagram. It's a lot of pressure trying to be perfect. And I'm going to tell you something. Perfectionism, by the world's standards, is useless. And there's a verse in the Bible that talks about being perfect, and we're going to look at that one. It's in Matthew 5, 48. It says, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. But this is not talking about being perfect the way that we want to be perfect, or being perfect the way that the world wants us to be perfect, to be a do-it-all and do-it-perfectly kind of a person. This word perfect in this verse refers to our integrity and our virtue. So our way of being perfect should be that we are trying to be more like Jesus. We should be listening at the feet of Jesus and learning from him and not worrying about the world's standard of perfection, but we should be worried about God's standard of perfection. In your notes, the most important thing is spending time with Jesus. See, we're all very busy, and we can be very busy doing very good things 
for our families and for our church, and we can still miss the one necessary thing, being with Jesus. See, Jesus makes our lives simpler. He says, just do this one thing, the one necessary thing. Everything else is not as important. You know, sometimes we have to let things go. We have to stop trying to do everything and do it so perfectly. We have to stop trying to be perfect by the world's standards and be perfect by God's standards. Because we could be busy doing a lot of things and still not be doing the one necessary thing. In your notes, I I might have to let go of some things to make time for the necessary thing. So moms and dads and everybody, if we are not at the feet of Jesus, if we are not spending time with him, listening to him and learning from him, then we aren't really serving him. And that's really the the message at the heart of this story of Mary and Martha. Because Martha was serving, but she wasn't serving in the way that Jesus really wanted her to. And if we aren't listening to Jesus, then how can we have the wisdom and the energy to to lead our children or or to, to do great in our jobs or to do anything that we have to get done in a day if we aren't putting him first? So our homework is to take a look at what we're doing. Take a look at how you spend your time. And if only one thing is necessary, then think about what you can eliminate that might be getting in the way of your relationship with God or getting in the way of spending more time with him. And here's your other homework. Give yourself a break and stop trying to do everything so perfectly. I hope that the story that we read today has just been a gentle reminder to you that you may need to refocus your energies just a little bit. Refocus your energies on Jesus. Martha wasn't a bad Christian. And if you find yourself being kind of like a Martha, you're not a bad Christian. Maybe we just need a little correction and a little redirection. And Jesus gives us that correction because he loves us so much. He wants us today to put him first, to stop obsessing over all that we have to get done and over these worldly standards of perfection. Jesus just simplifies our lives. He says, one thing is necessary. You know, it's so easy to get anxious and troubled about many things that are going on in our lives. And if that's you today, then Let's just together, let's just refocus on the one necessary thing. We're going to pray. Father, thank you so much for your word that is so good, that teaches us and that corrects us. And Lord, I just want to lift up anybody here today that is feeling troubled or anxious or overwhelmed in all of their responsibilities and in all of just the things that they have to get done. Lord, I pray that you would free them from that. God, I pray that you would give us the strength and that you would give us the clarity to reprioritize our lives, to be able to put you first, to be able to put you above all of the other things that we need to get done in a day. And God, I pray that you would help us to see what is getting in the way of spending time with you, what is getting in the way of us really listening to you. I just pray that you would help us to remember the one necessary thing and to know that if we're doing that one thing, that we are pleasing you, whether or not everything else on the list gets done, but that if we do that, that we are pleasing you. There's a verse in the Bible that says, what good is it if you gain the whole world 
but you lose your own soul. You know, we can gain the whole world by, you know, making, making a lot of money and, uh, you know, looking good and getting the best job and getting the best things. And, and that's, that's the world standard of perfection. But the Bible says, what, what does it gain you if you, you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Because we can have all of those things in life and still not have a relationship with Jesus. And that is the one necessary thing. So maybe you're here today and you've never had a relationship with God the way that Mary and Martha had. And you might not be entirely sure how to start that relationship with him. But Jesus makes it so simple. He says, if you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. That's all there is to it. And you can do that now, right where you are. You can call on his name. You can say, Jesus, you are my Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for simplifying our lives. Thank you for showing us that we need to do what is important to you. God, I pray that you would help us to let go of unnecessary stress and activities and anything that is weighing us down. We ask that you would help us to remember to put you first and to listen to you each and every day. In Jesus' name. Amen.
So, you know, Martha, she chose the one thing, the one thing that was important. I'm sorry, Mary chose the one thing. I don't even know what I'm talking about here. Mary chose the one thing, the one thing that was important. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, and Martha was going around so concerned, so anxious about so many things, and ignoring the thing that was most important, being at Jesus' feet. And in our lives, there's so many things that come at us that try to distract us from spending time with Jesus, from getting to know him, from getting in his word, by, from spending time in prayer and in solitude. So many things try to distract us. And so my challenge to you as well as a challenge to myself is to, to take some time this week to spend at his feet. I know that sounds like super spiritual to say it that way. Just spending time with him, spending time in his presence, being aware that God is with you. He's with you, inviting him to guide you and direct your path. And we are so glad that you guys came today. We can't wait to see you next week. Take care, guys.